Welcome to Ag PhD. I'm Darren Hefty. And I'm Brian Hefty. Thanks for joining us. You know, wheat harvest around the country is wrapping up. Well, not everywhere, but in a lot of places it's wrapping up. And we wanted to talk today about what you should do after wheat harvest, especially should you put in cover crops. We'll get to that today. Well, having crops out there is nice, Brian, but isn't that just more places for bugs to feed on? We're going to talk about how late season insects can still impact your soybean yields and what you need to do. Well, we have a tough to control weed of the week coming up later in the show. But first, here's this week's Farm Basics. Farm Basics is brought to you by the Liberty Link Trait and Liberty Herbicide from Bayer. The most reliable weed management solution, Liberty Link and Liberty Herbicide are the link to efficient row crop production and sustainable weed management. During our Farm Basics time today, we wanted to talk about what is a bushel? Why do farmers use this bushel measurement? Why do we talk about bushels of corn and so Well, you've got to have some sort of measurement, Brian. Otherwise, how can you compare from one year to the next? You say, well, I raised 100 bushels this year, but I'm hoping to get 110 yeah, bushels why, next year. Yeah, but why bushels? Who cares about bushels? Why isn't it just in pounds? Well, it's actually the bushel is, is an ancient measurement. It, it's hundreds of years old, and it came back from the British, Brian. So anything from the British has got to be a little bit unusual, doesn't it? <laughs> okay, so what it really <laughs> comes all right. What it really what it really comes down to though is back in the old days. I mean, centuries ago, they didn't have scales everywhere like we do today. But what they did have is these bushel baskets. And it's real easy then with volume, and everything was measured in volume back then. Well, today it is all obviously done by weight. And today a bushel just has a standard weight for each different crop. So for example, oats is 32 pounds for a bushel. Wheat would be 60 pounds for a bushel, just like soybeans is. Uh, corn, on the other hand, that's 56 pounds. So there is a little bit of difference. Why is there a difference in weight uh, for a corn bushel versus a soybean or wheat bushel, for example. Well, when you think about it, when something's going to be measured by volume, you're going to have different size kernels of seed. And when you've got soybeans, they're round. They may fill that bushel basket just a little bit different than a, than a corn kernel that, that's kind of flat. Uh, and, and oats are really a light kernel. So like we talk about oats, that's only yeah, 32 so pounds in a bushel. And shape. Density and shape. Farmers, though, they look at this test weight thing and, and say, okay, well, a bushel of corn is supposed to weigh 56 pounds, but what if I could make an even more dense kernel? What if I could make that corn weigh 60 pounds per bushel? Well, that's fantastic. If they can make a more dense kernel, they're going to get more yield in their field most times. So farmers are trying to raise the most nutrient-dense uh, kernel they can possibly raise and a good heavy strong kernel and that's what they're shooting for. We're selling our corn right now by the pound rather than uh, by a, a volume measurement but if we can get more pounds into each truck and, and off each ear of corn in the field we're going to get more yield in the field as well. Well once again the bushel is a unit of measure it's actually based on volume and what it really amounts to is eight gallons. So if you want to know exactly how much is in a bushel basket, it's eight gallons and whatever material will fit in that bushel basket. But, you know, since uh, probably the last few decades here, we've converted everything over to pounds. So it's actually done in pounds on the farm. And then we convert it back over to bushels. I don't know why we do that, Aaron. Well, it's just Seems fun, silly. Brian. You know, <laughs> math, math is so fun. Like, like I like to count weeds, Brian. If you've got a million weeds out in your field, especially if there are weed of the week, you need to get them under control or you won't have any yield to measure at all. Can you identify this week's weed? Back in 1966, Advanced Drainage Systems, Inc. was the first company to start manufacturing plastic agricultural drainage pipe in the United States. And today, ADS continues our leadership with superior pipe production and service capabilities. Our roots are firmly entrenched in the agriculture industry, and we're committed to helping farmers grow their business. With 54 manufacturing plants and 24 distribution yards throughout the world, you can count on ADS and our green-striped pipe to be there when you need us. Advanced Drainage Systems, the green-striped pipe you can count on. Just announced from Case IH and Tight Machinery. No payments or interest until January 2014 on most used combines model year 2003 and newer. This deal includes any 2003 or newer header purchased with the combine. Tight Machinery has the largest selection of quality pre-owned combines anywhere. Check out our website at tightmachinery.com and ask your rep about no payments or interest until 2014. Some restrictions apply. Offer ends August 31st. Tight Machinery and Case IH. Better solutions. 
For lower costs and higher production, see your Mandaco dealer. Ask about the best production built Land Roller on the market. Mandaco, simple design for easy transport and easy use. 12 to 62 foot widths, heavy duty 4x8x3 by by inch tube frame, and now available with a steerable wing wheel. Mandaco Land Rollers, improved soil to seed contact, faster, more uniform germination, less moisture loss. Eliminate downtime due to rocks. See your Mandaco dealer. Visit northcountrymarketing.biz or call 877-915-8790. Everything is better to the power of Nutrisphere N. Nutrisphere N. Proven to shield against leaching, volatilization, and denitrification, Nutrisphere N Nitrogen Fertilizer Manager helps you maximize the efficiency of your nitrogen applications. In fact, research shows that in 184 corn trials, Nutrisphere N increases yields by an average of 13.2 bushels per acre. Bushels per acre. Do the math for yourself. Contact your local fertilizer dealer today and take your operation to the power of Nutrisphere N. Hey everybody, I'm Steve Azar, singer-songwriter. Really happy that Brad Swenson and Swenson Investments asked me to write the song American Farmer. The American Farmer. I've had the pleasure of getting to know the fine folks at Swenson. And I gotta ask you, do you know what would happen to your farm if something happened to you? Swenson's works with farmers, lawyers, and their advisors to put together the best estate plan. Hey, you work hard for your farm. They work hard to help you keep it. Okay, Brand, so you got your wheat harvested, but it's a long time till we're gonna plant another crop yep. here. What are you gonna do to protect your soils? Well, it's not just soil protection. I guess when we start talking about this whole thing in wheat and, and after harvest, what do you do? We want to get into cover crops. We think it's one of the most underutilized technologies there is on the farm today. And you know, Darren, I even had to get notes out because I yeah. started writing down, well, let what me think this? about all the reasons why I should use a cover crop. And there were so <laughs> many, I didn't want to forget something. Oh my goodness. So, right. Okay, let's hear your list. Here's my list. Okay, so you talk about soil protection and erosion reduction was at the top of my list. So that was number one. Then it was increased soil organic matter capture, recycle, and redistribute nutrients in the soil profile. In other words, it makes nutrients more available to the next crop. Promote biological nitrogen fixation, weed suppression, provide supplemental hay or grazing, use or conserve soil water. Now it could go either way, you can either use it or you can conserve it depending on which cover crop you pick. Reduce soil compaction, salinity tolerance, attract beneficial insects, mycorrhizal fungi association, plus it's just fun. All it's right. fun to have something growing out there. All right, well there's a <laughs> lot of things on the list there. Now let's let's talk about this list just a little bit because when you've got all those different things, you certainly aren't going to get that out of just one plant, right. are you? Yep, and that's the whole thing. Most farmers who are planting cover crops are putting together two, three, four different seeds and they're planting that out there and what I always tell farmers when I'm advising them on cover crops is what's your number one goal and start there and find the crop that is best to fill that number one goal. So let's say for example you had super high salt high pH soil you just want to get something growing out there try to get something into production there at all well, then you might pick something like barley that has good tolerance. That makes some sense, Brian, but wouldn't you just start with something really basic like, hey, you know what, we just had a grass crop out here, wheat. Yep. Why don't I just look for some broad leaves so I have different bugs, different diseases, all those things. I don't want to have the same thing out here because what if you plant winter wheat again, which you're probably going to in this particular ground that we're well, on? Well, it just depends. Okay, so let's say, for example, that with this wheat crop, my next crop was going to be soybeans. Well, then why would I want to put a broadleaf crop in when my next crop is going to be soybeans? The whole thing is what we're trying to get out of this cover crop deal is at least a couple months of growth to fill these many different purposes that it might be, whether it's to prevent erosion or to try to get something into production in high salt ground, to use some water, to conserve water, whatever it is. We just want a couple months of growth and then we're going to kill this stuff off either with frost this fall, or we might kill it off with a herbicide. Well, I guess the other thing too is you don't want to plant something that you can't kill. And I know we see a lot of times where we have a drought year or a flood year, and all of a sudden guys will say, wow, we're gonna run short of forage to feed livestock. I need to plant something out there. And there are actually some neighbors of mine that planted some shatter cane back in the day because, <laughs> oh, that was a good food source for the cattle. And wow, they fought shatter cane in that field for the next 20 years. So you do have to be cautious about what you are planting, make sure it's something that you can control. And a lot of times you wanna make sure that it doesn't go to seed. Uh, if you plant the right cover crop mix, 
uh, work with a reputable firm. You can find something that, that yes, in my 60 days that I'm going to grow this crop out before I seed something else in there or before winter kills it off, uh, it's not going to go to seed and I'm not going to have a problem next okay, year. Okay, when you talk about this reputable firm thing, what my opinion is, is you need to be talking to an agronomist. I mean, a good agronomist about what cover crops you're going to put in. Sometimes seed companies, they're just trying to sell whatever seed they have, whatever cover crop blend that they have. They don't even know necessarily how it's going to relate to you and to your particular soil. So just make sure you're doing a good job of that working with agronomist. All right, now let's get into some of the things, some of the reasons people don't use cover crops, Brian. One would be, all right, we're in South Dakota and it's yep. really dry. If I plant yep. another crop, it's just gonna suck all the water out. Yeah, and that was one of the things that I always believed too. But when you stop and think about it a little bit, where is that water going? The water's going into the crop and that crop's just gonna stay there. We're not taking any grain off or anything in most cases. I mean, of course, if you want to uh, feed it to livestock, that's a little different deal. But in our case, we're just going to leave it out in the field. And what we can actually do, especially with some of these very deep rooted crops, and in just two or three months, we can get extremely deep roots down there. We can suck some water out from way down deep, get it up into the crop. Then when that crop dies off, we've got moisture that's real, actually relatively close to the soil. We're not overall going to remove moisture from the soil with the different crops that we might pick. All right, well, what about nutrients? That's the other thing that we hear yep. from a lot of guys is, well, you know, I, I don't wanna take all the fertilizer out of my soil with this crop. Yep, here again, if let's say you get a crop that you don't normally raise, it might be able to extract some extra nutrients that a wheat crop might not be able to get or a soybean crop might not be able to get. It can extract those nutrients, get it into the crop and making that crop, well, when you leave that crop, that cover crop out in the field, you just destroy it, till it under, just let it die, kill it off, whatever it is, uh, then you're going to have those nutrients pretty readily available when that residue breaks down. All so right. it's actually going to help you in terms of nutrients, not hurt you. Well, there are certainly many reasons why you may consider using a cover crop. We certainly feel it's one of the most underutilized farming techniques across the country. We think there's a lot of benefits there and we think more people are gonna do it in the coming years. But well, we do think seeding a cover crop is a good thing to do as long as it doesn't contain our Weed of the Week. We'll show you how to stop this tough weed coming up later in the show. Over the generations, fertilizer, the unsung hero of the farm has been in the background, quietly nourishing crops with very little fanfare. Until now. Meet the next generation of fertilizer. Micro Essentials. Case IH set the standard for improving power and fuel economy with SCR technology, while others were still trying to decide what the standard was. Only efficient power from Case IH is proven in the field 10,000 times over. And you'll find it in all our high horsepower equipment, from tractors to combines to sprayers. The world of farming is changing. Will you be ready? I'm ready. To learn more about how you can be ready with the proven leader, visit caseih.com slash efficient power. Micronutrients are not optional for plants, they are essential. TJ Micromix is a profit-proven management tool that ensures the availability of essential secondary and micronutrients. Formulated as a dry granule or liquid, TJ Micromix is plant available, easy to mix and apply. The synergistic fertilizer mix delivers consistent yield response on a variety of crops by complementing an NPK fertilizer program. Maximize yield on your farm this season. Call TJ Technologies or your fertilizer dealer and get your TJ Micromix today. For years, FarmLogic has been the easiest and most convenient way to keep up with your farming operations. Well, it just got better. Introducing FarmPad for your phone. You always have your phone with you, so entering records as they happen is as easy as a touch of a button. Chemical database, GPS, service records, and more. When you do it on the farm, save it on your phone and it's backed up forever. Call or visit FarmLogic.com for a free trial and find out why FarmLogic is the best decision tool for the farm. Why do more farmers choose Genuity VT Double Pro Rib Complete Corn Blend? For maximum yield protection. With two powerful ways to control above ground insects like corn earworm, corn borer, and fall armyworm. Plus convenient refuge in a bag with 95% traded seed and 5% refuge seed. That's simplicity. That's Genuity VT Double Pro Rib Complete Corn. The number one choice of farmers. 
Well, now it's August. Shouldn't we be done spraying bugs and soybeans, Darren? <laughs> we could be, Brian, depending on where we're at in the country. If droughts completely wiped out our beans, but otherwise, if the beans are still alive and they haven't started to senesce yet for getting ready for harvest, yeah, you still need to protect that crop. Well, let's talk about that drought first. You know, a lot of guys already in early July were ready to just throw in the towel on everything. And don't get me wrong, I mean, the corn yield is made pretty early, and there is, I mean, there's certainly some areas around the country, even on our own farm, we're gonna have 20, 25 acres worth of corn. It's gonna make zero, absolute zero, when we've got pure sand, have no rain, that's the way it goes. But soybeans, it's a whole different deal. If you get some late rain, then you could still have fantastic soybeans. So the point is, don't give up on your soybean crop just yet. Well, the other thing, Brian, that I like to point out is this. All right, if you're in a drought type situation, yeah, you say, oh man, I don't know if I wanna throw good money after bad. And I can understand yep. that thinking to some degree, but when you look at what it costs to spray for bugs, maybe two bucks an acre, you say, wow, I'm not gonna spend another $2 an acre to give my crop a chance. We're talking about a crop that needs every drop of moisture possible, yet it's under stress because there are bugs out there chewing on it. For two bucks, you can wipe the bugs out. You need like one seventh of a bushel to pay for that. You know, when, when we hit the 4th of July and the market started going nuts there for a while and, and wow, I mean, you went over $15 soybeans, $2 for insecticide looks pretty cheap. And, and you know, the market price is still fantastic why not take a look at those bugs if your crop is still growing and protect it? All right, let's talk just a little bit about some of these different insects. Soybean aphids is number one on the list. That's the biggest yield robber in soybeans year after year. And you know, we've seen even late applications, August 15th, August 20th, making good yield gains in soybeans. So our rule on soybean aphids is continue to scout, continue to spray up until the time your beans start to mature. So the time your beans start to turn color. Once you get to that point, then you can pretty much forget it. You're not going to have any yield gain. The aphids are going to be moving off anyway. But you got to be careful what you choose, Brian, because here, here's where a lot of guys fall down in this program is they say, okay, I've got some aphids out there. Oh, I guess I'll grab that pyrethroid again, give her another shot and wipe out that next flush of aphids. But all of a sudden, bam, spider mites pop up because that pyrethroid just killed everything else off in the field and the spider mites are still fine. Well, that could happen to you. So if you're in an area where you're concerned about spider mites, then you would wanna switch over from like a silencer or declare, just a straight pyrethroid, to the next level of pyrethroid that also gets spider mites, that would be capture, or you could certainly use Lorsban. Lorsban is real good too, that's an organophosphate. Uh, it's decent on aphids, quick knockdown, plus it has decent control of spider mites. All right, well, that's nice, Brian. So you can kill the spider mites, you can kill the aphids, but here come the grasshoppers, and by this time of year, they've got wings now. So they're adult grasshoppers, and they're very difficult to control. That low rate of a pyrethroid isn't going to work anymore. No. You know, how, how is Lorsban at a low rate, or how is Capture going to do? Do you well, need to with, jack those yeah, rates Yeah, with up? any of these products, I'd make sure you're using the full labeled rate if the grasshoppers now have wings. So that basically means they're in the adult stage. They've gone from uh, being the nymphs, now they're up to, to the adults. And adults are tough to kill, but if you use the full rate, of whatever insecticide you're using, you're probably gonna get them. But this has been such an unusual year. You know, you look at uh, all across the country, there have been insects that don't belong in that area that have blown in with winds and this kind of thing. And I've gotten all kinds of calls this year about, hey, I've got some thistle caterpillars. I've got, you know, some strange bugs. I don't even know what they are out there, but they're feeding on my leaves. You know, when you're talking about these insecticides, will it kill all these other unusual bugs that are in the field as well? <laughs> well, that, those are the calls that I love the most. Where guys will say, yeah, I got some bugs in my field. Will silencer kill them? I, you know, I don't know. Let's figure out what bug we've got first, and then we can go from there. So if you don't know what it is, get an agronomist out, or just take the bug and bring it to an extension agent or something like that. You've got to figure out what the pest is, whether it's a bug, a weed, a disease, whatever it is. We don't know how to control it unless we know first what it is. Okay, let me give you a couple specific examples then. Bean leaf beetles clipping off pods, and then an even bigger beetle, the Japanese beetle. Can you still kill that one? Okay, bean leaf beetles, you can use a relatively low rate of just about any pyrethroid, even Lorsban, just gonna be fine. Uh, with Japanese beetles, now you've gotta go to the high rate. Japanese beetles are absolutely more difficult to control than bean leaf beetles. When we start talking about pod clipping, my concern here is the pre-harvest interval. So make sure you know what it is for the insecticide you're using. It might be 21 days, might be 28 days, it might even be 45 days. Well, if you already have pods on and they're fully developed, 
Are you really gonna have to wait 45 days till harvest? Probably not. You're gonna be sitting there November 1 saying, boy, you know, my 45 days, it's finally about up. I, my corn's all harvested. Now I guess I better go get my beans. No, you wanna be able to harvest your soybeans on time, so make sure you're picking the right insecticide and the right pre-harvest interval. Okay, well, one of those uh, unusual bugs is corn rootworm beetles. Now there's lots of different types of corn rootworm beetles and a lot of people have trouble distinguishing them from bean leaf beetles. Yeah, but honestly, we don't care. We can kill them all with the pyrethroids or lorsman. It doesn't matter which type of corn rootworm beetle you have. All I know is if I've got corn rootworm beetles and I'm gonna be out there spraying anyway, I'm gonna wipe them out with any insecticide I use and it's a good thing. When, when you see corn, corn rootworm beetles, in your soybean field, they're there for one reason. That's to lay eggs, and next year when you plant corn, you're gonna have rootworm larvae there. We don't want that. So if you do see rootworm beetles out there, go ahead and spray them. Well, fortunately, with most of these insecticides that we're gonna control those late season bugs and soybeans, we can also mix something with it to control a late flush of our weed of the week. Can you identify this week's weed? You know how stressful it is when guidance systems go down. You lose field time. You lose yield potential. You lose patience. Help is here. Raven Cruiser 2 RTK with Slingshot. Precision. Simplified. Learn more at ravensimple.com. Our Weed of the Week is Black Nightshade. Darren and I, when we were growing up, we'd fight Black Nightshade a lot, and it was kind of a tough one because it would show up especially late in the season underneath that soybean canopy, hard to control. It absolutely ruined our summer because we had to keep going back and back and back until we had something with really good residual. In soybeans, black nightshades was terrible because those little berries would smash in the combine and they could actually plug the combine up if you had a lot of them. Uh, but the other thing they can do, even if you have just a few, is they, they splatter open and they have tons of little seeds in them. They stick all around that soybean seed and, and then all of a sudden you're gonna be planting them again next year if you planted that seed. So the best thing that came out for us was Pursuit back in the day and Raptor also has great residual. Well, even, even before that there was Scepter, Darren. Uh, you, you know, you're probably too young to remember no, this. I remember Darren, Scepter, but, <laughs> but it wasn't that great on Nightshade, Brian. It just, it wasn't as good as what Pursuit no, or Raptor were. No, but it was pretty good. It was a dramatic improvement versus what we had because basically back then we, it was Treflan, Sencor, and Bassagran were the key products. Oh my goodness. And none of those were very good no, no, no. on, on uh, Well, that's right. And it's still the same thing now. First rate's not that good on it either. We, you really have to go with Pursuit or Raptor. And even at a half rate, uh, the soil residual does a nice job, but killing them post-emerge when they're big, you have to add some Flexstar in there too. In corn... Well, yeah, oh. if, they're, if they're big. So if these weeds are two to four inches tall, Pursuit will get them. But once it gets a little bigger than that, we think Flexstar is a much See, better See, I'm just source. trying to move this thing along here, Brian. In corn, <laughs> nightshade really isn't a big problem. We can smoke it with Status. That's our favorite product to use on black yeah, nightshade. Yeah, but the Prees are pretty good too. I mean, even the Dual, Outlook, Harness, Surpass, they're not terrible. And then if you were to put, well, I'm just I love saying. that com backhanded compliment. They're not terrible. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, we're, a lot of people are using reduced rates. Even at the reduced rates, you're probably going to get 60% control. So, yeah, I mean, it's not perfect, but it's going to do a lot. Well, the great thing in wheat is we have this nice canopy. We normally don't have a big black nightshade problem. Uh, if you did, you could wipe it out with Husky. It does a nice job on it. Well, once again, black nightshade is our weed of the week. Make sure you get it under control because you don't want a bunch of black nightshade plugging up your combine. That's it for our Weed of the Week, but stay tuned. Iron Talk is coming up next. Iron Talk is brought to you by Case IH. The world of farming is changing. From the power and versatility of Steiger and Magnum tractors to the legendary reliability of axial flow combines, Case IH can help you be ready. To learn more, visit caseih.com forward slash be ready. Weed control often comes down to the smallest of details. We're going to talk about one of those little details that really doesn't cost much money you can change to improve your weed control in today's Iron Talk. With Roundup resistant weeds making weed control even that much more critical, anything that improves your weed control is important, but this year we saw pigweeds and lambs quarters getting through our field cultivator pass. And when you think about it, there's no weed that's resistant to iron if it's done right. So if we can change something up on our field cultivator to have better control, why not do it? Well, the big difference that we saw this year is where nine inch shovels were used in a one pass situation, it actually worked. But where we used seven inch shovels, it didn't. 
Now, where seven inch shovels were used in a two pass situation, it worked, but a lot of guys don't want to have to run over the field twice. They just want to do it once. So if you're one of those guys who wants to get by with just one pass of the field cultivator, then you should switch to the nine inch shovels. Our cost is like 20 cents a shovel more to go with the nine inch versus the seven, but that could certainly vary depending on what kind of shovels you're getting. The point is, it's not that much money to switch to a nine inch shovel rather than a seven. And if you're gonna do a one pass situation and weed control is critical, that's the way to go. That's all for today's Iron Talk and now back to the show. Not a weed. Hi. It's, it's our, our Agriculture, Agriculture Liquid, Liquid Sales, sales professional. professional. Brian's never really liked salesmen. But I like him. I heard you talking about testing products to make sure they work. You know, Agriculture Liquid Fertilizers does more research to prove our products than any other fertilizer company. Yeah, I've seen your reports. There's a ton of proof. We've been to the North Central Research Station. We've seen AgriLiquid's 500-acre proving ground up close and personal. We know that when we use Agriculture Liquid Fertilizers, it's like having all that research on our farm. It's like having Dr. Jerry and the team right here in your field. Dr. Who? Find out how Dr. Jerry and his team can help you increase yields at www.farmguytv.com. Hey, we have field days at the North Central Research Station in late summer. You're all invited. Speed, strength, and efficiency make Capello corn heads a head above the rest. Built with polymer components that exceed industry standards, Capello corn heads continue to push the boundaries for maximizing grain retention while using less energy. Visit CapelloUSA.com and learn more about Capello's state-of-the-art chopping technology that cuts cleaner, allowing your horsepower to remain where it belongs, with your combine, so you can harvest faster in all weather conditions. Add to that an amazing folding feature and it's clear to see why Capello is a head above the rest. Everything is better to the power of Nutrisphere N. Nutrisphere N. Proven to shield against leaching, volatilization, and denitrification, Nutrisphere N Nitrogen Fertilizer Manager helps you maximize the efficiency of your nitrogen applications. In fact, research shows that in 184 corn trials, Nutrisphere N increases yields by an average of 13.2 bushels per acre. Bushels per acre. Do the math for yourself. Contact your local fertilizer dealer today and take your operation to the power of Nutrispirin. Case IH set the standard for improving power and fuel economy with SCR technology, while others were still trying to decide what the standard was. Only efficient power from Case IH is proven in the field 10,000 times over. And you'll find it in all our high horsepower equipment, from tractors to combines to sprayers. The world of farming is changing. Will you be ready? I'm ready. To learn more about how you can be ready with a proven leader, visit caseih.com slash efficient power. Closed captioning for Ag PhD is sponsored by Norwood Sales. Introducing the all new Backsaver Swing Hopper Auger Mover. Backsavers have interchangeable parts which allows you easy access to move or swing your augers to fit your harvesting needs. Get yours today at Norwood Sales. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show, but be sure to tune in again next time for another Weed of the Week, Farm Basics, Iron Talk, and much more. I'm Darren Hefty. And I'm Brian Hefty. Thanks for watching Ag PhD. American ethanol is made primarily from corn. Did you realize that the type of corn used for ethanol and livestock feed is much different than the sweet corn on your dinner table? For more information, visit the Responsible Nutrient Management Foundation at rnmf.org.